I'd like to welcome everybody today to the August Web LDMS introductory training webinar. This is session one. Both session one and session two will cover the same information. As a reminder, this call is being recorded and I will be um, posting this recorded webinar, uh, session one and session two, to our Frontier Science YouTube channel. My name is Felicia Lenzo. I am the LDMS lead trainer here at Frontier Science, and I will be running our training today. I ask that you remain muted during the call and please utilize the chat feature to ask any questions that you may have throughout the course of this training. I will be paying attention to the chat, so I will be able to answer questions as they come in. Our agenda for today is to go over what the LDMS platform is, go over re, uh, resources and important contacts, uh, a brief walkthrough of some special equipment, and then we will walk through the LDMS platform itself. So what is LDMS and who is Frontier Science? Frontier Science is a nonprofit research organization with over 35 years of clinical trial experience. We act as a trusted data management center and statistical center. We provide software solutions for managing biological specimens. One of those pieces of software is the LDMS or laboratory data management system. The LDMS is a comprehensive laboratory information management system or LIMS. It is 21 CFR Part 11 compliant and meets NIST and FISMA guidelines. On the second half of the screen, you'll see a little workflow of how data comes in and out of the LDMS. LDMS will allow you to um, will act as your inventory management, allowing you to accession your primary and aliquot specimens, receive aliquot specimens from sending labs, and flag specimens for shipping and testing. On the right-hand side of the diagram, you'll see a couple of images. Uh, LDMS will act as a virtual storage that it will be representative of your physical storage workflows, allowing you to create your different uh, storage structures. LDMS is also going to help manage specimen shipping and curate related documentation uh, that will accompany that shipment, so the data file uh, that you would send along with the physical specimens. LDMS will also capture certain test results, and we're able to generate exportable data sets for internal or uh, external, for internal documentation and external collaborators. Last, LDMS can facilitate data exchange with other applications, allowing us to compile data across different clinical trial networks. Some important resources and contacts. First off, we have our LDMS.org website, which is going to include our project-specific documentation. We also have our Frontier Science YouTube channel. This is where our publicly facing recorded webinars are posted that you can find it at any time. The LDMS training team, we organize the training webinars such as this, but we also schedule project specific trainings. You can reach out to us at any time from lds.training at frontierscience.org. Last, we have LDMS user support. User support is available 24 seven. They will help with user account setup, and label and printer label printing and barcode scanner troubleshooting. You can reach user support via phone or via email, LDMS help 
at frontierscience.org. Some special equipment for those labs that are required to utilize a barcode scanner and the 2D uh, barcodes that are uh, generated from LDMS, depending on the clinical trial network you're participating in. The barcode scanner that you need to have needs to be compatible to extract global specimen IDs from the 2D barcodes that are generated by LDMS. You'll also need a label printer. The generated LDMS barcode labels must be printed on appropriate label stock. Labels must be adhered to each individual specimen. And please do not print your labels from Adobe Acrobat. Oh, excuse me, I misspoke. Please do not print your labels from your web browser. Please print them from Adobe Acrobat or the proprietary software that accompanies the printer. So let me just reiterate that. Please do not print your labels from your browser. Please print them from Adobe Acrobat or the proprietary software that accompanies your label printer. And we're going to walk through that uh, in today's training along with how to verify that your labels have been printed successfully. Last, just a reminder to any lab administrators or managers on the call to please keep your laboratory contacts up to date by accessing the Frontier Science Portal and navigating to submit contact changes. Labs should review their contact information and submit changes as needed, especially if there are changes to uh, personnel, whether they uh, become your shipping contact or your query contact, or if you have any personnel turnover. So updating and removing appropriate um, lab team members as your team changes. Okay, at this point, I'm going to hand the meeting over to Phil Marzenak. He is our trainer for today. Thank you so much. And hello, everyone. I am going to get started by sharing my screen. Hopefully everyone can see that. This is our uh, LDMS.org website. And uh, so we're going to begin our walkthrough. In order to access LDMS, we can do that a few different ways. and. One of them is by going to the uh, LDMS.org website in your browser of choice. If we are using the .org website, we can click on the LDMS login button over here. We recommend that you utilize Mozilla Firefox, Google Chrome, or Microsoft Edge. These are the three browsers that the web LDMS platform is validated on. If you are a new user, you will have received a login ID and temporary password from LDMS. That temporary password is only good for 24 hours. So once you, your password has expired, you will need to reach out back to user support to receive a new temporary password to complete your account activation with that first login. I am going to log in here. If you are a new user, once you have logged in with that login ID and temporary password, you will be brought to this page right here. Zoom in so everyone can see it. This is the training acknowledgement form. This form makes us confirm that we have been trained in some kind of training for LDMS. This consists of attending a webinar such as this, reviewing any of the previously recorded public facing webinars on your YouTube channel, reviewing any of the documentation or other user manuals on the LDMS.org website, or being trained by a team member. You will need to select yes, that you've been trained to submit your login ID and temporary password once more and click submit. And this will bring you to the web LDMS homepage. I do have an extra step. I do need to select which database that we're going to be performing our walkthrough in today. 
So I'm going to sign in, and this is going to bring us to our welcome screen. Just zoom in a little bit. All right. So with our welcome screen, I just wanted to zoom in to show you this top right-hand corner over here. When you enter LDMS, you'll be brought here. And in this upper right-hand corner, you're going to see your profile information. This will include your full name, your LDMS lab, and your time zone. This will also include the logout button. And in the drop-down menu, it will allow you to change your password. If you need to reach out to LDMS user support, you can click on the help button, which will allow you to contact support. At the end of your session, we do ask that you log out completely and you do not allow your browser to save your username and password. LDMS is tracking all transactions that occur within the web platform. And we want to make sure that there are no accidental logins and the individual who is performing the data entry aligns with the user profile that is logged in. Another feature we have with LDMS is this is going to be our navigation pane that we have up here. Zoom in a little more, sorry. There we go. Our navigation pane that we have right here. This is going to have all our different modules, starting with specimen management, storage, shipping, reports, labels, test results, uh, online resources, our administration, and then our data submission. Online resources is going to have links embedded to direct you to different functions, such as our validation resources, our Frontier Science website and portal, as well as the specimen repository website. I'm going to go into the administration module next and go under lab settings. I'm going to zoom in just so we can see this a little better. And then what we're going to do is we're going to uh, start off here with our process tech initials defaults to current user. Now, this first checkbox, when it is turned off like it is right now, no initials are going to be associated to the aliquot or primary specimens as the processing tech. And you will need to go in and manually add those initials. When this feature is turned on, and I'm going to leave it on for today's demo, the initials of the user will be associated to the primary and aliquot specimens created. This should only be checked if the technician who processed the samples is the same technician that is entering them into LDMS. The next feature is the require a comment when modifying primaries and aliquots. This feature is a change control process feature that will allow any updates to the primary or aliquots who occur as long as a comment is placed in the comment field, which we encourage teams to use. This is up to the lab's discretion, as we understand it can be a barrier to your workflow and efficiency. This is a nice feature to have to make sure that comments are added when any changes occur, whether it's a general post-processing update or if you are resolving data discrepancies. I will be leaving this on feature on for today to show you how it works. The next is the auto frozen set date time to current date time when storing specimens feature. When it is turned on, like I have right now, the time and date will be assigned to the specimens as the current time and date. This means those specimens physically went into your storage in your lab at this date and time. This may or may not be relevant to your workflow. If you have this feature turned off, you will need to manually set your frozen date and time to your specimens. I will leave this off for today's training. Any changes that you make to within your lab settings, you will need to now click save in order to implement those changes to your database. Our next module is going to be specimen management. There we go. That looks good. Specimen management has a few different features. 
First, we have the specimen management function, which will allow us to view our specimen inventory, which we have right here. Specimen management is going to be organized by our individual participant records, which will have your project and participant information here. Here's our project with our PID. At the top left hand corner, you will have a record and then showcase all study visits, which we have right here. By sliding to individual records using our left and right arrows, we can then scroll to different participants based on our filters. I will remove them so we can see this is all our participants in our LDMS. And I can select them by using our front and back arrows, our first and last arrows. We also have a wheel that we can use, a scrolling sliding wheel to go to our participant, or we can click on the jump to participant, put in their project information and their ID and go directly there. I can even utilize my filters here on the left hand side of the screen. We have our storage filters. We have our shipment filters. We have our specimen filters. We have our visit filters, enrollment filters, and our participant filters. These, this will reduce the number of records we are viewing based on the filtering criteria. So for example, if I was to select Frontier, you can see I have less participants than I did originally, and with more filters, I can narrow that list down. The participant record is going to show all protocols, studies, visits, and specimens for a specific participant. And these features are going to be dynamic, allowing us to see everything on one screen. The first level of dynamic functionality is going to be our ID2 protocol or our study field. You can have this drop down menu available showing me the different protocols this individual is enrolled in. And if I was to select any of the protocols listed from the drop down menu, we are going to see the visit grid, primary grid, and aliquot grid update showing us those visits and specimens specific to this protocol. The next level of dynamic functionality is going to be our visit grid. The visit is going to have our visit value in units, the collection date, our ID3 sub protocol ID, and our clinic value. As I toggle between the different visits selected here in blue, you will see the primary grid and the aliquot grid update according to the specimens that were related to the selected visit. Our last level of dynamic functionality is going to be our primary grid down here. If I toggle between the different primaries, we are only going to see the aliquot grid update. And those are going to update based on the aliquot specimen specific to the primary that is selected. The primary grid and aliquot grid are going to share a lot of features. The first is going to be the global specimen ID, which we have right here. The global specimen ID is the LDMS unique identifier that is assigned to all LDMS specimens when they enter the LDMS database for the first time. This ID will travel with the specimens even if they are shipped to a different laboratory. The global specimen IDs are going to start with your LDMS lab number and then they're going to be followed by an alphanumeric string. And at the end is going to be a three digit code. The primary specimen and aliquot specimens are going to be linked by their global specimen ID. They will share the same parent upstream alphanumeric sequence and be differentiated by the ending three digit code. All primary specimens are going to have 000 ending with 
ending, and then all aliquot specimens are going to have a range of 001 to 999, allowing us to have 999 aliquots derived from an initial primary specimen. Our next column in both grades is going to be our status columns. The status column is going to be a series of icons that will either be colored in or grayed out, depending on any flags assigned to the specimens or any physical status. So the first icon that we can see is going to be this little grayed out circle here, but we can see it's checked down here. And this is our availability icon, letting us know whether or not the specimen is available. Our next icon is going to be the refrigerator. This is going to let us know if the specimen has been assigned to the storage module of LDMS. And then we can see what it looks like when it's not. The envelope will tell us if a specimen has not been shipped, is flagged for shipment, or has been shipped. And we can see just by hovering over, the arrow says it's been shipped. The uh, little paper clip says pending shipment. And then if it's blank, it has not been shipped. And then we have our clipboard indicating it's a specimen has been assigned for testing. And we can just see the difference here. The primary grid has one additional icon. It's going to be this dual figurehead indicating if the primary specimen has been co-enrolled between studies in order to reduce the number of collections for that participant. The primary grid will then have our collection details with our collection time, the primary specimen type, the additive type, the specimen condition code, and the available volume. In the aliquot grid, we can see that we have the derivative type, the sub-additive derivative type, and any reagent information. We have our specimen condition code and available volume. I am next going to navigate to our specimen management module and go to the quick add feature. Quick add is going to be where we want to add specimens to our database. We can add specimens a few different ways on the screen, and I'm going to walk through each of these. Some of these that I'm going to show you may or may not be relevant to your clinical trial network that you are participating in. Please review your project documentation and follow the requirement of the clinical trial network. If you are participating in a clinical trial network, some of them do require the use of quick add templates, while other clinical trial networks require manual entry. I will be performing both of these today to demonstrate the different functions within the LDMS quick add function here. The first way I'm going to add specimen is going to be with a manual entry. So you can see by our quick add screen, I have these fields that should look familiar. They are what we saw on our participant record. We have our participant information, which is going to be up here. We have our enrollment information, then our visit information. And then if I scroll down, we can see our primary and aliquot information as well. First, I'm going to choose my project, which will be Frontier. I will then put in our participant for today, which will be there. We go. My protocol or study for, for uh, study from the enrollment study will be study one. I can either type in my study information or I can use the drop down menu uh, that we have available right here. Then I'm going to put in my ID3 information. Your ID3 is your sub protocol ID. So in this case, it will be arm A. I will then choose my clinic and my collection date, which will be today. And then I will define my visit as visit one. So to recap, we've defined our participant information, 
our enrollment details, and our visit details. And now we need to define our primary and aliquot specimens. In the primary grid here, there is an add new button. And when I click on it, LDMS is going to populate my first primary. It is automatically going to populate as whole blood, but I can change that by clicking on the drop down menu or manually typing in the three, the three letter specimen code. Uh, defining my primary specimen type. In this example, I'm going to leave this as whole blood. And if I uh, hover over, we can actually see the codes will be defined in LDMS. For my additive, I am going to select EDTA. So I can either type that in or I can use the drop down menu and I can hover over to confirm. Three letter codes, uh, these are going to be used to define your visits, visit units, primaries, additives, conditions, uh, along with some other fields potentially. And you can find the list of all of our three letter codes in the back of our user manual. I am going to go ahead and put in my collection time. As a reminder, LDMS uses a 24 hour clock. The collection time being the time the specimen was collected directly from the participant and the received time is the time in which the processing lab received the primary specimen. I will then define my volume and we are going to do 10 mLs. So this is our whole blood primary collection here. And then down below in the aliquot grid, we can see this says aliquots for primary number one. If I click on the Add New button twice, I'm going to be creating two different aliquot types as a result of processing. First, I'm going to define the total number of aliquots I will be creating. In this case, we are going to be creating three of each. The value here will tell LDMS to create that number of records of the specimen type that we are creating. Now, I will define the two different specimen types. Our first is going to be double spun plasma. With no additive uh, addition code, satisfactory, and our volume is going to be one ML. Our second derivative is going to be our PBMCs. In my derivative type, I will put CEL. And then for the sub additive type, we do have uh, something to put here. We're going to put DMS, which is our three letter code for DMSO. Which, which is our cryo preservation solution. I will then define my volume as three and leave this satisfactory. And then I will also update my units to CEL. So we are going to be using LDMS logic here. And LDMS was always going to apply a 1 million multiplier to the value whenever I have CEL as my volume unit as well as my derivative type. This is creating records that are going to read as 3 million cells apiece. So to recap, we click the Add New button in our primary information. We define our first primary collection. As a whole blood with EDTA, we defined our collection time, receive time, volume of units, value, volume, and volume units. Then we clicked on the add new twice to create two aliquot types that are going to result in the primary whole blood that we are processing. And we're going to be creating three double spun plasma and three PBMC aliquots. If we had a second or third primary collection at the visit, we can add those by clicking add new in the primary grid. And as you can see, a new primary specimen has populated and our aliquot grid has cleared out, allowing us to define the aliquots associated to primary number two. The primary collection is going to be a urine sample. With no additive. And it's gonna have the same collection time and receive time. And also going to be 10 mLs. For our aliquots, we are going to click add new once and update the aliquot total to three. 
since we are making three smaller urine aliquots, we are going. We are not going to be transforming the urine into pellets and liquid. We are going to keep that urine sample whole and just make smaller volumes. We have the three smaller urine aliquots here. The dynamic functionality should look uh, similar to how uh, the participant records as we toggle between the two primaries. Just going to finish defining my specimen with the urine. And now when I click through, we can see we have our double fund plasma in cells from our blood, our whole blood, and our urine aliquots from our urine sample. Once we have put in all of our participant information for enrollment, visit, as well as our primary and aliquot, I can click the Add button. When I click on the Add button, as long as everything has been successfully and correctly added to our quick add screen, everything is filled out properly, we will see a successfully added note at the top of the page telling me I successfully added three double spun plasmas, three PBMCs, and three urine aliquots. From here, I can click on the Print Labels button, which will allow me to generate labels for this set of nine aliquots that we've created. Because I have accession specimens under a specific project, I do have defaults set up for my labels. Depending on the project you're participating in, you will see that project listed here, and you may have a reduced list of the available label formats that are available. We can also see if we are going to be generating a barcode with our label. In this case, it's going to be an LDMS standard 2D barcode and 1D barcode that will populate within our label. So you can pick the format here with our project, and then you have the drop down to pick the size. In this case, our format is going to be ID1, ID2, label 2, and we are going to select size 41 for our label. So I will then go ahead and click on the Generate Labels button. And this is going to create a PDF document. As you can see, it automatically downloaded to my Downloads folder. Depending on your browser, your browser settings, you will either see your documents automatically download to a location of your choice, or you will have a pop-up asking you to open and save your document to a specific location. Please review your browser settings when you're utilizing LDMS to know where the document will land. So here we have our labels. This is going to create a PDF document, as you can see. Uh, now that we've opened our label document, allowing us to view this PDF, here is our 2D barcode and our 1D barcode. I then have my project participant information uh, right here. I have my uh, collection date, global specimen ID, and then we have our primary and aliquot details as well. If I want to print these labels, I do not want to print it from the print button in my browser. I want to take this document and open it in Adobe Acrobat or the proprietary software that came with your label printer. This will make sure I have more uh, robust printer set settings, which will allow me to adjust the intensity and burn of printing to make sure that my barcodes are printed at a high enough resolution to be successfully read by a barcode scanner. So once we have printed our labels, we want to verify that they have been printed successfully and by being read by the barcode scanner. So we can open a Google document or a uh, notepad page and click in it. And then we can scan our label. And as you can see, it worked and it scanned into the document. And then we're going to see the global specimen ID populate. And in some cases, you will see this FSQ that is there in front of the global specimen ID. 
this is going to be a format that you might see when scanning outside of the LDMS platform. And you would test all your labels. We'll just test a couple here just to show how that process works. So this does verify that our label was printed successfully as the global specimen ID aligns with the global specimen ID of the label we scanned. We do want to make sure that we verify our labels before adhering them to our specimens. This will benefit us when we try to store specimens, perform the QAQC process and shipping, and will help prevent any issues downstream with receiving laboratories who may be using the barcode scanning to confirm import of your specimens after shipping. I will move these barcodes off the screen to use later, and we will navigate back to LDMS and close out of our print labels, which we've already done. The next way that we can add specimens to our database is going to be utilizing a quick add template. This is going to load information onto this quick add screen predefined by our project or clinical trial network. I can utilize the template from the drop down menu and try to find it in this very long list. The template list is going to have all templates that are available across all clinical trial networks. I want to use my fil my filters here to reduce this template list to find what I'm looking for. So I will go ahead and choose Frontier for my project. And I will go to the template drop-down menu. And as you can see, I have a much shorter list that I can choose from. I'm going to choose our Visit to template. And then LDMS is going to ask if I want to load the template data. If I click yes, this is going to populate the information here onto this quick add screen and clear out any information we may have already started to add. Since I have clicked yes, as you can see, my project's been populated. And my studies have been populated as well. Here is our whole blood with our EDT uh, additive and our double swan plasma and PBMCs down here. And then we also have our urine aliquot or urine primary becoming three smaller aliquots. The template does most of the work. I do have some fields I need to fill out with our participant ID. So we will put in our participant ID first. I will then put in my ID3. In this case, it will be arm A again. We will choose clinic one and today's date as the collection date. Because my primaries and outputs have already been defined, LDMS is now asking if I'd like to cascade this collection date through to my receive date and processing date. LDMS would like to assume that all of these activities happened at the same day. If this information is incorrect and you do not want to cascade this information, I would click no, and then you'll be able to manually type in your received date and processing times. I'm going to click yes, and then you will see that our collection date and our uh, received our received date has matched or has populated. All now I have to do is find the collection time and receive time. So now if everything is collected and received at the same time. I can highlight and hit control C and control V and copy paste. So in this case, I'll put in my value and I can control right click copy, right click paste, or sorry, I can control C, control V, and this will allow you to uh, save time uh, with the data entry burden. Next, I want to review my condition codes. For example, let us say these smaller urine aliquots are not created for some reason. I'm going to go ahead and update my condition code here from SAT to SNC. I'm going to still have a record for these urine aliquots, but there's not going to be a physical sample, sample associated with them. 
This is preferred by clinical trial networks. Instead of utilizing the delete button, because this is going to keep a record of the expectation. So we expected to have these three-year aliquots, and this will explain why we do not. Because I did update this condition code, I'm going to go to the edit button of these aliquots. This is the edit aliquot window once you click on the button. And we're seeing the aliquot details. I'm going to update the reason the specimen was not collected for this example. I will use the drop down menu and click on the optional specimen not processed and then click save. This comment will be associated with each of these three year aliquots. They will be physically unavailable, but there will be a record of them, which I will show you in a moment. Clinical trial networks will have a condition workflow or flow chart showing you the scenarios in which certain condition codes are being used in the appropriate scenarios to use them. Please refer back to your project documentation once again to make sure you are utilizing the condition codes appropriately and whether or not you should be using the delete button, which we do not recommend using with quick add templates because it is the expectation to have a record of collection. Even if specimens were not able to be physically collected, we still want to record that expectation. So I'm going to click Add, and my records are going to be added to the database. To recap, I used my filters over here. My template filter is my project. I then chose my template. From the drop-down list, we confirm that we wanted to load the template data. Then we put in our participant ID, ID3 clinic, collection date, receive date, collection time, and receive time. I did not have to put in as much information as I did when I did the manual entry. And then I clicked add. And then we can see the specimens up here that were added. Our last way to add specimens to our database using quick add is going to be utilizing the multiple participant ID feature. So first I'm going to utilize a template just to make things a little faster. And now I can add a participant. I'm going to use visit three this time. I will add in my participant. And I will go ahead and put in, I will click add ID one PID. I also have a Google Sheet document that I have over here. And this has my three participants on it that are coming to the clinic today. These are the participant IDs of my three individual participants. So I'm going to save this as a CSV file. And then it's now in my downloads folder and I can upload that with this button right here, the upload ID one PID file button. I'll go to my downloads and open. And it's saying that it's parse three pins, which I had on this document from the uploaded file. So I will go ahead and click OK. Here are those three IDs listed. I can always modify this list by deleting a participant. And then I can always put them in by manual input. But now we have a list of four pins, one we entered manually, and three that we entered with the file. A note about the multiple participant IDs is if you're going to be using this feature, we do recommend that you are paying attention to your visit information. This is because when you are using the multiple ID feature, you will be creating the series of records. In this case, double spun plasma, EBMCs and urine aliquots. You will be creating a set of specimens for each individual participant. This is a great feature to use if you're having multiple participants arrive at the clinic on a specific day for the same visit and collections. The only information that I would need to leave out is collection time and receive time because maybe I don't know when those individuals are arriving at the clinic today. Now I'll put in the rest of my information my ID three, my clinic, and my collection date. I'm going to click yes for cascade. I'm going to leave my collection time and receive time blank 
because I don't know what time my participants are coming to the clinic today. Again, this is a great tool to use if multiple participants are having the same collections done for the same visit details on the same day. But if you're having multiple participants arrive throughout the day and they're going to be having different visits and different collections, I would recommend against using this multiple participant ID feature as you'll have to go back and revise your specimen records for each of those individual participants. I'm going to click the add button and we're going to see a list of our specimens that we've created for each of the individuals here. We have participant A, B, C, and D. We can even generate labels for all these specimens. I'm now going to navigate back to our specimen management function and we will go look for these records that we've added through our different examples today. In order to find my specimens quickly, I'm going to utilize my filter and I'm going to search on collection date for today. My specimen records are going to be reduced to just those records that we have collections from today. And then we have three participants from the multiple pit entry, and you can see that there's no collection or time associated with those. And we can do that by going to number three, no collection time. for each of these participants. As well as the third visit from this one. Oh, let's see. If we navigate back to our first participant and click on visit two, this is the visit where the urine aliquots were not created. You can see from the status column and the aliquot grid showing these specimens are not available. The specimens here are not physically available because they were not created, but we do have the record of expected collection with the condition code SNC listed on the aliquot. We also have reasoning for why the specimens were not created. If we click on the edit button of any of these, we can see the reason defined as the optional specimen uh, processed. Now that we've added our records to our database, our next step is going to be performed post-processing on these specimens. We can apply post-processing a few different ways. The first is by going to the edit menu of a primary specimen that does not have a collection time. So we can start off here. This is going to open up our specimen details, showing us all the fields associated to our specimen. Any of the fields that are available can be modified. I'm going to update the collection time of the whole blood. See that the collection date was defined, but the time was not. So we're going to say seven o'clock in the morning. And now I'm going to click the save button. And when I click save, you get a pop-up telling me a specimen has been modified and to enter a comment. Again, I have that change control feature turned on where I need to require a comment being entered into this comment field in order for my change to be saved. I'll type in my comment that I added collection time. And then I will click save and and then I'll, I'll get confirmation telling you my comments have been saved, but I'll get a request asking if I want to cascade my comment to the respective aliquots. I'm going to click yes and show you what that looks like. So if I go down to one of the aliquots, the comment will exist here. And the collection time has been updated with the primary. Now, if I go to any of the aliquots associated, we'll see that our processing time has been updated 
has not been updated. So we're going to do some post-processing with the aliquot as well. We go to the edit button just like we did with the primary. And let's say we wanted to update the processing tech initials for the specimens. I can clear out my initials and put in my teammates. I'll add my comment as we saw from earlier. I'll go ahead and click save. And now this is the aliquot cascade. I have modified my processing tech field and common field. I have the option of cascading these changes through to the other aliquots associated to my primary. I can cascade this comment and change to none of the other aliquots, all the other aliquots, or only aliquots of the same derivative type. Because this is a double spun plasma sample, only my double spun plasma samples will receive this change. If I choose the only aliquots of the same derivative type, which I'm going to do, and click OK. Now if I go into any of these double spun plasmas, we will see that has been updated and changed. The other way to update aliquots simultaneously is by selecting, is by multi-selecting. We can click on the control key and highlight multiple samples. So in this case, I'll do the three PBMCs. And now I'll click the edit button for one of them. You can see my edit window looks a little different when I have all of my fields grayed out, but I do have these check boxes next to them. If I need to add any information, I can do that. Say I need to update my processing tech initials here, I can do that again. And then I'll put in a comment. And then I'll click save. And you'll notice that I didn't get a pop-up asking if I wanted to cascade that information through to the aliquots because I did a multi-select feature. These are the two different ways we can update multiple items simultaneously. And you can see if I go into any of the PBMCs, they are all updated with the same change. Other features in our participant record are going to be the drop-down menus next to our edit buttons on the primaries and aliquot specimens. You will be allowed to a, uh, assign tests to any of the specimens, mark your specimens to ship, print labels uh, for each individual specimen as well as your primaries. For our PBMC samples, we do have one additional feature, and this is our cryopreservation details. This function is for specific clinical trial networks for specific projects. In crowds preservation within specimen management, I can click on results obtained and then fill out any additional data around HIV status, primary status, aliquot details, and technician details. Any changes that I make to the screen, I want to click save in order to implement those changes. The storage module can be accessed from the navigation pane, and I'm going to go to stored samples. The storage module is going to be a virtual representation of your physical storage solutions. So here's an example freezer that I generated, freezer one fill. I will start with my freezer, and then if I click on this, plus button over here, I will then have shelves that I've assigned to my freezer. I can then click on this button and see the stainless steel racks that I have assigned to my shelf. And then I have four boxes on our 
uh, rack number one. Some of these boxes do contain specimens that, as we can see. Now you will notice that there is a set of brackets before the name of each item. And these brackets indicate the individual positions. This specimen here is going to be in position one in my box. And this box is in position three on my rack, which is in position one on my shelf, which is in position one in my freezer. To create new storage, I can go to the action drop down menu and select add storage unit. And this is going to allow me to create the largest storage container. This is going to be our freezer, refrigerator, liquid nitrogen tank, or something along those lines. We will call this freezer, freezer one. Call this August freezer. The type is going to be a freezer. The temperature, we will go ahead and select minus 80, but as you can see, we have all the way from liquid nitrogen down to room temperature. I can then define the number of rows and columns. Rows and columns are gonna give us a 2D representation that we can see right down here in our preview. Let's show what this will look like. This freezer is going to have four by one sections. Each section is going to be its own shelf configuration that we are going to design next. If I'm gonna use the same configurations frequently, I can save this as a template, and then I could just go ahead and use the template up here from the drop down list. Um, I do have my freezer defined, so I will go ahead and create our August freezer, which is a minus 80 freezer. My next step is going to be adding the shelf configuration. I'll go ahead and click on the edit drop down and click add new level. If I have a template, I can use that once again. Uh, but here we're going to create a one by four. configuration for the shelf. This gives me four individual positions within that shelf. And I'm gonna use this configuration because each of these individual positions will hold a five by five stainless steel rack. And I'm gonna give my shelf a name, shelf one. And click continue. I will now designate where in my 2D structure of the freezer the shelf is going to go. Here are my four sections. I can choose them by either clicking on one of them or using the drop down menu. I will go ahead and put it in position one and click save. So now I can see my shelf is here in my August freezer and I can go to the edit button and drop down menu and click add new level. And this is gonna allow us to add one of those five by five racks that we talked about. So I will go ahead and enter rack one for the name. This is gonna be a five by five rack, able to hold 25 different uh, positions. I will go ahead and click continue and now choose where this will go on my shelf, just like I chose where the shelf went in my freezer. Once again, with the drop down and the click, I can go ahead and select position one and click save. And that is now assigning rack one to position one in our shelf, which is in position one in our freezer. My last step is going to be creating containers that I will assign specimens to. With my rack selected, I can go to that edit drop down and click add new container. I have one additional feature when adding new containers, and this is adding multiple containers at a time. 
as long as they had the same configuration. So in this example, I'm going to create five nine by nine cryo cryo boxes. We also have a template available as well for the containers. So I'm going to go ahead and turn off my positions only button. And then you'll notice this is going to allow me to edit what we have as our column and row labeling. The boxes currently have an alphabetic alphabetic uh, nomenclature. We can change the alphanumeric. Uh, we can change the orientation right to left, left to right, top to bottom. And then we have what we call our fill order. And this is going to allow us to automatically fill the box based on the empty spaces available in the order that we decide, which can be changed best to suit your workflow. We also have the excluded positions button. If you wanted to exclude a specific position, we can go ahead and select that. So I've created my 9x9 nine nine cryo box. I'm happy with how this criteria is. So I will check that. And now I or I will leave it open like that. But if I check it, it would just go back it's the other way. I'll go ahead and click continue. And now, once again, I get to assign my boxes in the rack. I can choose individually and uh, or use the drop down. I can also select the autofill, which will autofill based on how I had that selected previously that we just discussed. So I will name this box one. This will be box two. And if I was to autofill from here, I wouldn't have to pick the positions. And then we can see these boxes populated as I have my autofill in spots one through five. I can go ahead and click the plus sign, which we already saw. And now that we've created our storage configuration, I'm going to start assigning specimens to these boxes. I can assign specimens a few different ways. And I'm going to walk through all of them. Some of these may or may not be required by your clinical trial network. As I said earlier, please review your project documentation to make sure you're following the requirements of your specific project. The first box we're going to uh, store specimens in is going to be our plasma box. So I'm going to go to our box one and click edit. And I'm going to rename this plasma box. Click save. To store specimens in our first method is going to be our manual storage. So I'll go down to the drop down menu. and click store specimens. This pulls open our specimen picker window. We've seen this in our labels module, same set of filters that we have, our participant filters, enrollment, visit, specimen, and shipment. I will go ahead and filter on specimens collected today. And then I'm also going to go ahead and filter on our double spun plasma. And I'm going to add it. Maybe I have an extra filter. Hold on a second. Okay, that was added. There we go. When I select these two filters, I have the 18 specimens available. If I open up this window a little more, you'll be able to see uh, which participants these specimens came from, and the other, other collection details, visit, collection date as well. 
but here are the specimens that we created today during our training. I'm only going to store participant A samples, so I'm actually going to copy this participant ID. Or I can use a filter, but I'm just going to select as well. We could use the participant ID. And we're only going to do this for visit one. I'll go ahead and click continue. Now I can individually assign the double fun plasma to the spots as we've discussed earlier. But I will use autofill and have them autofill to the first three available based on how I have my autofill set. And then I can click on the box and see they autofilled positions A1 through A3. So now we can see that they are stored here in my plasma box. The second way that I can assign specimens into storage is by using our barcode scanner. So I'm going to store our urine samples next. So we will go to box two. And I will rename that our urine box. I will go ahead and click save. With my urine box now selected, if I look in the upper right hand corner, we can see we have the plus sign over the barcode icon. This tells me that I can store specimens using my barcode scanner. You can see if I hover my mouse, I'm getting a text bubble that says scan a specimen, uh, scanning specimen barcode with container selected to store or move the specimen. If I go back up to the rack level or the shelf freezer, you see that has now changed to a magnifying glass. And if I was to highlight over there, I can see that I can actually find a specimen within the storage module at these higher levels, but I cannot store a specimen. And when I highlight, it says scanning specimen barcode to locate that specimen in storage. So I will go back down to my urine box container. I will get the labels for my urine samples. And I will go ahead and scan them into this container with my barcode scanner. And there's the first specimen. And I can assign manually or click auto assign, continue. And then I will scan my other two urine samples as well. I use my barcode scanner to assign each of those individual specimens to my urine box. If I do want to avoid the select positions window, I can turn on auto assign and auto assign will automatically assign the specimens to the next available position in fill order by bypassing that select position functions that you saw. And that's right up here. If I wanted to add more specimens to a box or create a new box, for example, let's go to box number three. And we will name this our PBMC box. And I will click save. I now have the auto assign storage positions checked here to bypass that select position window. And then I will minimize. I will now go back and select my PBMC box. And just like I did with the barcode scanner previously, I will go ahead and assign these three uh, PBMC samples to my PBMC box. And as you can see, I'm not getting that pop up. And if I go to the drop down, oops, maybe I didn't have it clicked. 
There it is. And then our third specimen. Perfect. I must not have been clicked in LDMS. So now we can see they auto assign according to the position that I wanted them to based on how I had the prox box predefined by having that feature up here checked. And that allows me just to scan my specimens right into the container. This will help your efficiency and timeliness as long as the fill order follows your workflow. However, it is going to give you a lack of control and you need to move the items around to specific locations within a box or create spaces, you may want to turn the auto assign off. You have more control and flexibility on assigning items. Now that we have stored items, we can move items around. There are many different ways to move items. The first way is going to be moving individual items, and we can do that by selecting on them uh, the ones that we are interested in moving. So if I was to go to my plasma box, and I will go to position A1, and then I'm going to move this specimen into box four. I can click the drop down to move this item. And then we have our navigation tree, and I can just navigate to box number four, like we said, select, I can autofill or just click continue. And now we can see that that plasma one is no longer in A1 in the plasma box. It's in box number four. I can also move items using the barcode scanner. If I want to move this specimen back up into my plasma box, I'll go ahead and select my plasma box and then scan that specimen's barcode. I can go ahead and assign that back to the A1 position. Or place it somewhere else. So now my specimen has been moved out of box four and back into the A1 position in the plasma box. If I want to move multiple items, I can go to the Actions drop-down menu and select Move Storage Items. This pull, pulls open our storage tree. In this example, I'm going to move all the specimens out of my plasma box into box four. So I'll go ahead and select one, two, three. Then I would click Next. And then I go back into my freezer into box four. And now we can see they are all in box four and there's nothing in my plasma box. Now my plasma box is empty and my box four has all my specimens. The last way I can move items again, I'm going to go to my action drop down menu and move stored specimens filter search. I can go ahead and use the same filters that I had before to filter to my specimens. And then I will go ahead and select them. And then I can go ahead and navigate where I want them to go, which will be back into the plasma box in, with the fill order. And now, once again, our plasma samples are back in the plasma box. Now, all of my specimens have been moved. Now I can generate some storage, some reports for storage. The first report we're going to generate is the print storage action report. And this is going to be from the drop down menu. The storage action report is going to be a running log of everything you've created and everything that you've moved or has been updated in the storage module. So 
you can see right here you've created everything that you, everything you've created and that has been moved it's going to show that we've created our freezer, our racks, shelves, and boxes. We're seeing who performed the action and the date that that action was performed. We're seeing the specimens that were uh, moved or have been updated in location within the storage module. And we're also seeing who performed those actions and when that occurred. This is a helpful report if you have multiple users in the storage module simultaneously transact performing transactions. This will allow you to see the transactions that have occurred by your team members. The next report we're going to generate is at the box level. And I'm going to generate All right, we're going to go to the click on the edit button, go to the reports drop down, and we're going to start off with the storage detail report. Actually, first, let's do the container report. So this is going to be our container report, and this is going to be a 2D representation of our box. The X's are going to indicate empty position, and our fill positions are going to have our specimen details. The legend is going to be listed in the upper right-hand corner. And if you are creating your storage ahead of creating your physical storage, you can then use this as a guide or keep those reports alongside your liquid nitrogen tanks to see what you have in storage and how they're organized. All right. The next report we're going to do is at the freezer level. These two reports can be generated at any level, but I'm going to generate them at this level. Uh, today, we're going to look at the storage detail report and empty storage locations. So we'll start with the storage detail. The storage detail report is going to be a summary of the specimens in your storage unit at the level you selected. Because I chose the freezer level, we're going to see all the specimens and how they're organized within that freezer itself. We're going to see each individual box, starting with the freezer name, and then going all the way down to, to the individual positions. We'll see that for every box that has the specimen stored within this. The next report we're going to do is the empty storage locations report. And this is exactly what it sounds like. It's going to show us all of the positions that are available within the containers assigned to that level. The freezer has some boxes. Four and five are completely empty. We have 81 positions available there. The PBMC plasma and urine box both have some positions filled, but that the remaining are empty. The last thing I want to do while I'm in storage is I'm going to utilize my mark to ship filters. I am going to apply these filters to boxes and specimens within the storage module, and then we can use these filters to find our individual specimens or containers within our shipping module uh, to build our shipment. But first, I'm going to assign my urine box the mark to ship flag. We can see that little green flag here. And then I'm going to assign my plasma and PBMC samples in their respective boxes.
So now that I've marked my urine box and my samples marked to ship, I will now go to the shipping module and I will navigate to shipment history. Shipment history is going to show a running log of all completed shipments imported or exported by your database. This includes incoming and outgoing shipments. You're going to see their indexing number here. That is your shipping number, and that shipping number is unique to your LDMS lab. Your shipping numbers are going to be different from everybody else's. We are also going to see our shipment type. Uh, whether the shipment was sent or received, shipment format, the data file format. This is the data file that will be associated with that shipment. Our destination lab, sending lab, temperature, setup date, shipment date, our received date, the uh, shipment number of the incoming shipment, and our QAQC for all completed shipments. If I click view, we can view a shipment by clicking on that button and it'll show us the high level details. There we go. This will show us our full shipping destination right here our contact at the sending lab, any shipment notes, and then we can also click view to see the contents of the shipment itself. It even allows us to see how the specimens are physically organized in the container as well as their global specimen IDs for the specimens on that shipment. From the view drop-down menu, I can generate any relevant documentation for my shipment and for received shipments. I can perform my QAQC and I can download my shipping file that I need to send along with my ship, uh, physical shipment to the receiving lab. And that can be downloaded at any time after shipping is complete. To create a new shipment, we'll be going to shipping and go to pending shipments. The add new drop down and click create shipment. On our general tab, we will choose our shipment date. We will choose our format. I'm going to leave this as LDMS, but if I was sending specimens to a non LDMS, I would choose a non LDMS file type, which we have available here. And then I'm going to define my temperature. In this example, it'll be dry ice. At this point, I'm going to click Save. This is going to give my shipment a batch number that we can see right here and add my shipment to the pending shipments queue. To continue creating our shipment, I'll click on the Edit Ship button, and then I'll go to our shipping destination. When I choose my destination, I can choose from my address book, which is right here. The address book is going to show all LDMS labs indexed by their LDMS lab ID. If I want to add a new lab, I can go ahead and click on the radio button, New Lab. I would enter all of the shipping information and contact information associated with that, and then click on the Save Address right here, and then click Save. And then this will add that address to my address book. Any new addresses are going to appear at the end of the address book. They are going to have a 999 in front of it and then their indexing number. If we choose a non-LDMS lab, for this example, I'll use our example lab, 999002. We'll see the LDMS lab number here is locally saved. And that's what is being populated here. And their LIMS type will be defined as non-LDMS. If I go back to our general tab and go to the data file format, you can see that I now have an error. Because this is the non LDMS lab. And that's because the LDMS file type is proprietary to the LDMS platform. and can only be opened and viewed by LDMS. 
if I try to open the LDMS file outside of LDMS, it's going to corrupt the file and then it cannot be opened. Since I did choose a non-LDMS lab, I want to change my data file format to a non-LDMS file type. So I will select CSV, and then we see the flag disappears. I am going to select the LDMS file type because I am going to change my shipping destination to an LDMS lab. So go ahead and do that. And if I go back to general, I see that more, that flag has left. I will then define the contact person at our lab. I will go ahead and then navigate to the contact at the sending lab, and then I will enter my information. Then we can go to our shipment notes. And here I can add in anything for comments, uh, disclaimer if necessary, our carrier information if we have it available, and our tracking number. As a reminder, LDMS does not communicate with your carriers or couriers. This is the lab's responsibility to coordinate your airway bill and packaging label. But you can provide that information here. It, is, it will be kept along electronically with your shipment. My last step is going to be adding my shipping contents. And I can do this two different ways. I can add a container from storage, or I can create a new container and cherry pick the specimens that I want on that shipment. First, let's do the storage container. We'll add a new We'll click Add New in the Storage Container level, and this is going to open our storage container tree. We can go ahead and use these filters, uh, Mark to Ship, which is what uh, we, we used during the end of our storage module. And now I can navigate on this tree to find any containers that are marked to ship. We have our urine box with our three urine samples in it. I will go ahead and click Add Selected to Shipment. And now we've added our urine box with our three urine samples to the shipment. If I want to create a new shipping container, I can click on the Add New button. And this is going to be similar to creating a storage container. First, we'll define our rows and columns. I'll make a 9 by 9 cryo box again. Uh, once again, uh, we'll define the specimens on that shipment. But first, I'm going to choose my sort order. And that's going to be the specimen ID, which is right here. I can then go ahead and click Add Specimens. And this is going to open our specimen picker window, as we've seen before. I will leave the same filters. Uh, no, I will use different filters. We want to use our Mark to Ship filters. So we can go ahead and shipment, mark to ship, yes. And now we have a much smaller list of shipment of specimens that are marked to ship. And we're going to do today's date. So we can also whittle this down. There we go. Now we have the six specimens that we marked from today. I will go ahead and just pick the first five. Click continue. And now we have them in our container here. I'll go ahead and click add. And now we've created a container with our five specimens that we selected that were marked to ship, that were flagged earlier, and now we have added that to our shipment.
So I now have specimens from my urine box and my plasma and PBMC samples in the new box that we've created. So I'm going to go ahead and click save. My next step is going to be creating the physical shipment. I can generate some reports to help with that. So I will click on the edit drop down edit ship drop down menu to see my available reports and the first one we will do is the generate manifest the manifest is going to update in real time as we add or remove data from our shipment this report can be generated at any time during the shipping process it's showing that our QAQC was not performed the shipment has not been shipped yet the intended shipping destination the notes uh, are right here contact at the sending lab and then we're going to see the manifest itself the urine specimens are going to be in the first box, and then the PBMC and plasma samples are going to be in the second container. The next report I can generate is going to be the container report from the same drop down menu. And this is going to be similar to the storage report container report giving us a 2d map of the specimens on the shipment in their respective boxes we have the urine aliquots down here and then we have our other specimens in the box over here the next report that we're going to generate is going to be our storage report our shipment storage report The shipping storage report is going to give us a line-by-line -line description of where each specimen is located from the freezer all the way down to the individual positions in the box. Each specimen will have its own set of information. And once I have my shipment uh, prepared in this example, I'm going to generate my 1D and 2D barcode reports. Okay. So the 1D barcode is going to have our 1D barcodes with your global specimen ID as well as your participant ID. And our 2D barcodes are going to have uh, the 2D barcode with our global specimen ID and our participant ID as well. The only difference is that these are going to have the 2D barcodes versus the 1D barcodes. I'm going to move these barcodes off screen, and I'm going to utilize my, them in my QAQC process to be my imaginary specimens that we are going to be evaluating. Now that I have my physical shipment set up, my last step is going to be performing that QAQC before we click ship. QAQC is the chain of custody protocol. I will use the drop down menu and go to QAQC. And this process can be done two different ways. We can utilize our pass fail buttons that we have right here and manually review the individual specimens with our eyes and confirm or deny that those specimens are the correct specimens that should be on the shipment. The other way to perform QAQC in the way that is encouraged and recommended and sometimes required by different clinical trial networks is the use of the barcode scanner. Again, this is why we want to make sure our labels have been printed successfully to be read by the barcode scanner. If we are performing QAQC manually, we're going to use these pass-fail buttons.
with our first specimen here. We are going to pass. We're going to remove the specimen out of the box, review the details in the label, and that the specimen's global ID aligns with the specimen global ID that's listed up here. We can go ahead and click on the pass button. Oops. Sorry. We will then match this global specimen to what we see. We see that it says manual here under the scan ID. This is going to let us know that this was done manually and that we did not use a barcode scanner. And it's going to show the specimen. It's going to show uh, that we only use our eyes to evaluate the specimen details. And this is going to be the same with a failed specimen. We can see that it was uh, uh, manually done and that the global specimen ID failed. We get this little exclamation point here. If I was to use my barcode scanner, our QAQC window will look something different. So I will go ahead and QAQC my first specimen. If a specimen passes, which it did right here, I'm going to get an OK, and I'm going to see that the global specimen ID matches the global specimen ID under scanned ID. For what was expected. If a specimen is incorrect, There we go. So we can see what it looks like when it does match. If it doesn't match, what we can see in this example is that if a specimen is incorrect, but it should be on the shipment, it's just in the wrong place, you will see that the correct coordinates populate here where it is in the shipment. And it's going to show us the actual global specimen ID that was scanned and how it doesn't match, which is why this failed. In this example, if a specimen is incorrect, but it should be on the shipment, or sorry, if this is incorrect and it should not be on the shipment at all, we will see the correct coordinates listed as not found. And let me get another example of that. Um, nope. And now we can see it says not found right here. And that's what I wanted to show you when we scan that. I will now click save. And we will look at the QAQC report. The QAQC report is going to capture the same information we saw in the QAQC window. We will see if a specimen was scanned manually or if it was scanned with the barcode scanner. We will see also if it passed or failed and who performed that action. As a, it also shows if it was not performed at all. As a reminder, it is the lab's responsibility to resolve any failures of the specimens evaluated. Specimens may need to be relabeled because the barcode scanner could not read the label on the specimen that needs to occur. If specimens are in the wrong position, they need to be placed in the correct positions. And if incorrect specimens are on the shipment, they should be removed and replaced with the correct specimens. QAQC should then be repeated until all of your failures have been resolved to passes, and we want 100% pass on the specimens evaluated. What this means is if you may have different percentages of specimens to evaluate per container, depending on specimen type. For example, if you are performing QAQC 
on PBMC samples, they need to be maintained in a cold environment in liquid nitrogen for as long as possible. And you do not want to break the cold chain. You may be required to only evaluate one specimen per row in the QAQC process, which would be approximately 10% of your specimens. But that 10% needs to be 100% passing. However, if you have a different specimen type, for example, FFPE blocks, you may be evaluating all 100% of the specimens that are FFPE because at room temperature they are stable and you are unable to impact the specimen condition by keeping them at room temperature. And in that case, you may be evaluating 100% of the samples in that scenario. Please review your project documentation and documentation provided by your clinical trial network on your requirements for QAQC. Now that we've performed our QAQC, I'm going to go back into the edit ship, review my tabs to make sure everything is correct. And then I can click ship instead of save. When I click ship, LDMS is going to create my LDMS data file and move my shipment out of uh, pending and into the shipment history. You can see the file just downloaded here. My shipment is also no longer in the pending queue. I will now go into shipment history. And here is my shipment that we just put together today. If for some reason I cannot find out where my data file is, I can go to here and re-download it. I'm going to navigate into a different database. So we can go ahead and import that shipment. I'm going to navigate back up into shipping and go to receive shipments. You will see these features as import directly into storage for the import as is. This will allow my import specimens to be placed into the shipping import freezer in the storage module. If I go back to the storage module, you can see we have this shipping import freezer right here. This gives your imported specimens a virtual storage location, and then you will move those specimens out of the shipping import freezer into their forever home within your virtual storage configurations. I will go back to receive shipments. And I will click on Select File. Now we'll go ahead and click on that file that we generated from the other database. Click Open. And then I will click on Preview Shipment. And this will allow me to review the details of my shipment. Further down, I will be able to view the details of my shipment, the general information, our shipping destination, our contact at the sending lab, shipment notes, as well as the shipping contents. And then we can also see where they physically are in the container and the global specimen IDs associated. I will need to come up here and define, confirm my temperature, which will be dry ice. And then I can go ahead and click Receive Shipment. I will now go to our shipment history. And I can see we have our shipment here. And I can go ahead and perform my QAQC on this Receive Shipment. I will perform the QAQC the same way I did in an outgoing shipment by reviewing the specimens on the shipment by using my barcode scanner or using my pass fail buttons and confirming that I have received all of these specimens as expected. I will now net go into storage and go to our stored samples and navigate to our shipping import freezer. And I will look for that shipment, which is I 
That's weird. Must be 119. I apologize. Here it is. So this is the shipment right here where we have our box with our five samples and our urine box with the three samples. From here, I can move these boxes or specimens into the correct storage location using any of the methods that we walked through earlier. We could go ahead and use the move this item feature. We can go ahead and use our barcode scanning of ability that we did earlier, or we can use the actions drop down menu for the move storage items and move storage items from the actions drop down menu. I will now go into our uh, test results module and we will walk through that. This is one of our last two modules for today. The test result module is going to have a grid here. Our run grid where all of our test results are going to be listed and this is where we're going to be assigned a run ID. To create a new test run, we'll go to the Add New dropdown and click Add Pending Results. I will then select my test name. In this example, we'll do the Abbott, Abbott Real-Time HIV-1 RNA and click Continue. I will then fill in my run date for today. I will type in my associated tech initials. And then we will select our input volume, which will be 0.6 for this example and our prep method, which will be the M2000SP. I can also add a comment if I want, and then I can save my progress and add my test run to the run grid, which we can see right here. And this will give me a run ID. I can go and click the edit button back into the test results window. And then I click on the window the results window here, and I will open this up so we can see everything. You will notice at the top of my screen, I have a control grid with three controls listed currently. By clicking on the add control button here, I can add additional controls by selecting something that we've used before. I will go ahead and use this one and click add. In the specimens grid, I can then add specimens from my database by clicking the add specimens button here. These are specimens that we will add to our grid. I will go ahead and just select two double spun plasmas for this example here. And now we've added two uh, plasma samples and I have four controls. At this point, I will click Save. I will go to my Edit drop-down menu, and I will click on the Pending Test Results Report. This report is going to show us the list of controls that we have, as long as the specimens that are to be evaluated. I can take this report to my bench and perform my analyses. I even have 2D barcodes for my specific specimens that we are evaluating. If I'm using a software platform with my equipment that can receive a 2D uh, barcode scan, it's available right here. I can also generate 1D and 2D barcode reports that we saw earlier in today's presentation right here. Once I've completed my analysis and I have my results file, I will go back into my test run by clicking on the edit button and navigate to the results tab. And I will scroll down to the unmatched results from file and click upload file. I am going to 
grab my file. I am going to click yes. This will allow the plate comments to populate in the run comments field. When I clicked yes, you saw there was a flash of yellow here at the top of the screen that was auto matching uh, the results to the controls. I also have confirmation note asking that we just saw about the plate comments. I clicked yes, and then you notice that the specimen results did not auto match to those results and they're still left blank. Down below in the unmatched results grid from file, we can see all of our additional test results that were not auto matched. Auto matching occurs when the global specimen ID matches the sample ID or other specimen ID aligns. In this scenario, my control names aligned, but my sample IDs did not. So I will need to drag and drop my results from this grid into my result grid, and I can do that accordingly. If I grab the wrong result, I can always remove it and replace it with the correct result. Once I've associated the results of my specimens for evaluation in my controls, I can go ahead and click Save. This will allow me to go to the Pending Results view. It will allow me to update the results for those specimens. When I click, click Complete, This moves my test run into the completed phase, which we can see right here. And this allows me to perform the review process. If I open the completed test results window, I have fields that are grayed out and open fields to provide my reviewer details. I also have a tab for my control results as well as my specimen results. In my specimen results, you will see I have a column for sensor system sensors that were automatically applied right here based on the limits of the analysis. I can also apply sensors if I want from the drop down menu. And these definitions are listed in the user manual, but you can also highlight to see uh, what they are, hover over to see what they are when selected. The control tab also has sensors applied as well that we can see. If I navigate back to the general tab, I can also apply a sensor code for the entire run, then add my reviewer details. Seeing when I completed the run and reviewed the run. Go ahead and click review. This moves my test run into the reviewed status. I can no longer edit my test run. You can see everything has been grayed out. From the edit drop down, I can generate the reviewed test run report. This is going to be an internal document giving us a summary of our run, including the specimens and controls evaluated, as well as the results and sensors applied. And I can also generate the participants report. And these reports can be provided to your clinicians. The last module we are going to go through today is the reports module. I am going to go to the standard reports, and this has certain categories of reports predefined and pre-formatted. The first report we are going to look at is an administrative report. We're going to look at the transaction log report. Then I will choose my criteria. In this case, we are only going to look at transactions from today. 
I will click add and then I will generate the report. And it can be generated in any of these file types listed here in our drop down menu. I will go with the PDF. Here is the transaction log. You will see I performed many transactions today. The transaction log is going to be your audit trail. This may be requested as part of your end user validations or by audit or regulatory bodies as well. The transaction log is going to show us who performed the action, the date, and the time that action occurred. We have a transaction ID as well as when as well as the actual event that took place and whether it was an update, removal, or addition. The next report we're going to generate is going to be a specimen report. And this is going to be the specimen processing report. And we'll use today's date for the specimen report. And this report is organized by primary specimen and associated aliquots. Similarly to how, how a participant record is organized, except this is going to be sort of page format. We are going to see all of our overall specimen details. We are seeing the specimen type, additive, collection, bond collection, date, received date, and receiving processing time, and the processing tech initials. We'll see the information for the associated aliquots as well, including frozen date, frozen time. This is a great report if there are many gaps in your data. You will be able to see at a high level if you are missing anything, such as processing time or frozen time. Specifically, this report is going to be helpful if some of those data fields are required by your clinical trial network. Using this report to help find those gaps can help you resolve issues before any queries may be issued to your lab. The last report we're going to look at is a storage report. This is going to be the specimens not in storage report. And I'm going to filter out a collection date of today's date. And these are all the specimens that I have accessing but may not have stored in the storage module of LDMS. This report, we want it to be blank. This tells us that all of our specimens, based on our filter criteria, have storage locations in the storage module of LDMS. This report is going to be particularly helpful if you're participating in clinical trial networks that require the use of the storage module of LDMS. If you generate this report daily or weekly, depending on how quickly you are accessioning samples into your database, this can help you make sure that you are following through on all the necessary steps that you have accessioned specimens and that you've stored them in LDMS. We would want to go through and find all of these individual specimens and assign them their respective locations in the storage module. At this point, I'd like to open up the chat and see if anyone has any questions around the platform itself. Be happy to walk through any additional examples or any questions that you may have about Web LDMS. Additionally, if you have not already, please go into the chat and type in your information, last name, LDMS lab ID, and any participating team members viewing your shared screen. I'll leave the meeting open for a few moments to collect any questions that you may have. And if there are no questions, I'd like to thank everybody again and have an excellent Friday. Oh, it looks like there is a question in the chat. Regarding receiving the import of specimens, is the import of specimens still the same where you populate using a file from the sender? Uh, yes, so in the receive shipment um, screen uh, that you can see Phil is on right now, you would select 
the select file button, which would then allow you to import the shipping file from the sending lab. If you are receiving a shipment from an LDMS laboratory, you'll receive an LDMS file. If you are receiving a shipment from a non-LDMS partner, um, you will need, you will be receiving a non-LDMS file. It will most likely be in the form of a CSV file formatted specifically for the LDMS uh, to read the file and import the data um, into the database. Um, if you do have any um, additional questions around importing a shipment um, from a non-LDMS partner, um, please let us know. All right, everybody, if there are no other questions, we'd like to thank you again for attending today's training and have an excellent Friday.